Oh, right. Perfect. Um, thank you so much, Sam. Um, Thank you. yeah, so I'm Matthew. I am the, uh, one of the six inspectors actually at Seattle Housing Authority. I've been at the Housing Authority for about two years now. And uh, before working there, I did housing case management services uh, in the Pioneer Square area, focusing on uh, getting people from street and shelter to housing. And this work is really, uh, really in my heart's core. All right. So now here we are with our special inspections process. So with the special inspections with Seattle Housing Authority, we think of them in uh, two different pathways or two different options. So what we do is we essentially um, have tenant complaint inspections and landlord complaint inspections. And we'll go ahead and start with tenant complaint inspections. So when we have a tenant who submits a complaint, um, usually it has something to do with something wrong going wrong in their apartment or something going wrong um, like that has to do with some kind of item of functionality. And when we have this happen, we typically get an email or a call from a participant who will then essentially uh, submit that to us. And what we do is we then review that. We have uh, two inspection coordinators at our office who get to review all those emails and all the, again, take all those calls. So when we get a complaint from our participant, uh, the first thing we're gonna see is, have they submitted a work order? Because we wanna know um, if they've taken initiative to communicate with their landlord about the problem. And so when that happens, um, we really wanna make sure that we're screening those complaints and making sure that they do fit within the NSPIRE inspection standards. And typically what we'll do is if we find that the landlord has not responded within uh, about 10 days, then we'll send an inspector out to contact the landlord and do an ins a complaint inspection. And typically we will notify you first uh, before we go out, because we don't want anybody to be surprised. We want everybody to be on the same page. And so um, the only time where we, let's say, would jump the gun and not notify the landlord right away is if we get notification and proof of an emergency situation. Let's say we have a fire, a flood, no power, um, big presence of a mold-like substance all over the unit, things that could affect health and safety in a drastic way. In those situations, uh, we're just gonna be sending somebody out right away because we have to take health and safety into consideration. All right. And now we've got the complaint from the landlord. So when we have complaint inspections from the landlord, um, the first thing we're gonna ask is, has lease enforcement been completed? And Essentially, if we don't have any proof that lease enforcement has been done, then we cannot initiate a complaint inspection on behalf of the landlord to inspect for things like severe clutter and trash and things of that nature. So in the same way that it's the landlord's responsibility to enforce their lease and submit lease violation notices when appropriate, it's also the tenant's responsibility to comply with their lease and the uh, program requirements with SHA and HUD. And our complaint inspections function almost exactly like our regular annual inspections as far as timelines go. So when we have a complaint inspection that fails for, let's say, moderate items, let's say we have uh, a few burners in the stove are out, um, or we have some issues with the windows being able to open cl and close fully. In that situation, like an annual inspection, we would be going out 30 days later to do a reinspection. So for our housing authority, we do reinspections as well for complaints and also for annual inspections. And in the same way, if we found an emergency situation at an annual inspection, we would also be going out within 24 hours again to make sure it's resolved for a complaint inspection. So in all cases, we are doing reinspections and we are following up. And um, 
in the same way that Crystal had mentioned, if we're unable to verify that the repairs have been done, or if we found find that they haven't been done, then we would be processing the unit for abatement. Or in the case of a uh, tenant responsible uh, health and safety hazard, such as severe clutter, things of that nature, we would be referring them for non-compliance if they do not uh, comply within that correction period. All right, so now we're going to jump right into Inspire. And so with Inspire, um, this is something that Seattle Housing Authority transitioned to uh, October of last year. So we've been working through it for uh, quite some time now. And um, it's been <laughs> quite a ride, uh, a bit of an adjustment for all of us involved, definitely for landlords as well. And if I were to describe Inspire anyway, I would say it's almost exactly like HQS, but a little more precise and descriptive of what deficiencies are. So it's a lot like HQS, but just a little more, a little bitty, bitty bit more precise. So some history here. Um, at SHA, we had been doing housing quality standards forever, uh, like over 30 years. Uh, this is something we've been doing for, you know, I, we have inspectors who have been here for over 11 years and they've been doing HQS that long. Um, and HQS is, as you know, housing quality standards. And it's focused on uh, the minimum condition standards of the unit, uh, making sure that it is uh, decent, safe, and sanitary is what we would say. And in our public housing inspections team, uh, we were doing uh, uniform physical condition standards or UPCS. So in this situation um, for quite a while, we had been working with different sets of inspection standards. And in some cases where we had some overlap and um, we had a few tenants who were both public housing and HCB, a very few, but some. And it got kind of confusing for some of our folks because they would be wondering why we have to do a reinspection for this inspection, but not for the other one. So this had come up uh, in the past and this is what Inspire is so great with. Essentially, what we're doing is we are aligning our inspection standards um, to make sure that everybody is, you know, all on the same page and that there is uh, very clearly defined deficiencies. So what we're doing is we're prioritizing health and safety and habitability um, over the physical appearance of the unit. Um, we're less so looking at the cosmetic issues or any um, defects that would not impact health and safety. And so again, with uh, Inspire, um, what we're doing is we are making sure that the deficiencies are very clear, very precise. Um, although HQS does do a great job of being very descriptive, um, it does leave some room for uh, interpretation and sometimes um, inconsistency. So what Inspire is gonna be doing is, is gonna have the goal of making things very um, consistent throughout our inspections. All right. And so again, with uh, Inspire, what we also have is very clear deficiencies for three areas. And the main focus are the unit, which we all know is obvious, the unit that the participant resides in. We also have the inside, which is the inside of the property and any areas that could impact the tenant. This includes things like amenities, laundry rooms, um, anywhere from like tenant uh, storage rooms, rooftops, things like that. So anything that could impact the tenant, we will be inspecting. And inside is usually also including things like emergency lighting systems and hallways, fire extinguishers are also very important. So all these things would be part of the inside inspection. So inside the property, but not in the unit. And then lastly, of course, we have the exterior pro of the property where we'd be looking at uh, health and safety uh, deficiencies on that exterior that could impact the tenant. And so this is gonna get into some clear examples. This is gonna be good. So we've got this uh, HQS, description of ventilation. So it's describing uh, what the ventilation systems include. It's describing the standard. So the electric vent fans, for example, must function when the switch is turned on. 
And it also describes what to do uh, when the electric current of the unit has not been turned on, such as inconclusive, for example. And so now we're going to move to Inspire. And so when we look at this, this is what our standards are going to look like with Inspire. And so rather than talking about the um, or describing the standard in detail, what we're doing more so is outlining the deficiencies. Inspire is all about focusing on the deficiencies. So essentially, we'd be looking at the deficiencies for ventilation. And if we were inspecting a vent system and didn't see any defects that fit within those deficiencies, we wouldn't be writing it up as a fail. And so as one example, we have the exhaust system does not respond to the control switch. Think when you go into a bathroom and you need a ventilation system in the bathroom, you're going to flip on the switch or press the button, whatever you have, and you're going to make sure that the ventilation system turns on. And so as you can see, it even has uh, examples of actions the inspector would take. Pretty simple. They would turn on the exhaust system, listen, make sure it's on, and then turn it off. Um, one thing that Inspire does not describe more of is situations where let's say the system would be working, but we're just not able to hear it. And there are ways that we can test uh, for ventilation systems to be working um, without necessarily hearing them. Um, a really one example, kind of a funny example is if you take a very thin uh, square of toilet paper and you put it on the vent, if it sucks it up, we can say it's working. And that test is used by all our inspectors when we say, hmm, that fan's kind of quiet. I don't know if I want to write that up. Let's find out. And so now let's get into some major changes with Inspire. So this is going to outline um, essentially what have we inspected before? What are we inspecting now that we weren't inspecting before? Um, what deficiencies have changed? And what items are now emergencies that weren't previously emergencies? And there are many of those. So for example, we've got cabinet and storage. It used to be that inspectors could uh, just fail uh, a couple of damaged cabinets, you know, defective in some way, but now it's very clear. Um, and the language that I wanna point you to is really interesting. Note that 50% or more of kitchen, bath or laundry cabinets, drawers or shelves are damaged and pay attention to the parentheses. Visibly defective impacts functionality. That's very clear on what damage means. So we can't just say, oh, it has a scratch on it, replace it. We're gonna say, is the functionality damaged? Can I pull the drawer all the way out in the kitchen cabinet or can I open the cabinet door without it falling off? And can I open all the way? And so 50% or more of those cabinets in a specific room or area have to fail. So I wouldn't be looking at all the cabinets in the unit combined as one number. We'd be looking at each room separately. I'd say for a bathroom vanity, for example, is more than half of those cabinets defective. Same for a kitchen. And we also have call for aid systems and we're not, we had not uh, assessed those previously and now we are. Um, this is very common in uh, supportive living situations or housing that supports people with disabilities. And that's primarily just for uh, safety in case they have a fall or they're unable to call for help verbally. And um, these would be an emergency deficiency if we found some uh, major defects with the call for aid system. And we also have a new emergency item with clothes dryer exhaust. So we're not inspecting washing machines unless let's say they have a leak or some other problem, but we are inspecting dryers and making sure that the exhaust ventilations are fully attached. We've seen situations where the vent duct is uh, detached, it's caved in or broken in some way. And when, whenever we have that, that's gonna be a 24 hour fail item. And we also have fire doors, for example, we had not previously called out fire doors explicitly. And now the fire door standard is much more clear. Um, we have, for example, when we have evidence that a fire door was installed, uh, we would say that if it's missing, that's 24 hour fail. Um, and we also have a 30 day fail items for fire doors. This would include anything that impacts the safety and functionality of the door. Um, a lot of the time, what I've seen is missing hardware, like self-closing latches or holes in the fire door. Or a really important example is when 
hardware or components are repaired or replaced, but there's no documentation indicating that um, it was done by the manufacturer or with their product. Um, that's going to be a very important part of fire doors that I would like you guys to keep an eye on is uh, when we do write up fire door deficiencies for these reasons, we do need manufacturer documentation for repaired fire doors. And again, that is just to make sure, and the rationale is that we want to make sure that those new components that are repaired are fire resistant. Um, we don't just want any kind of uh, hinge, for example. And now we also have uh, electrical conductors and outlets and switches being a 24 hour item. So the easiest one in the book that we see all the time is the cover plate. Um, switch or outlet cover plate is missing or cracked in some way. Um, when we have a missing cover plate, we're now writing that up as a 24 hour electrical hazard. So that's no longer going to be uh, 30 days. Uh, that's now also in line with exposed conductors uh, in the circuit box, uh, such as missing uh, breaker switches and knockouts that expose that circuit box. A new one that has been uh, somewhat frustrating for our housing providers has also been the uh, ground fault circuit interrupter or GFCI uh, outlet standards. So now uh, we're now requiring GFCI outlets to be installed within six feet of all water sources in the unit and the common areas if applicable. So when we have um, a GFCI outlet, let's say at the kitchen or the bathroom that's near the sink and or the toilet and it's not GFCI protected, that would be written up as a 30 day fail item to be corrected. And it's also important to note that we are not, uh, as they say, grandfathering in any properties. So even if you have a house that's let's say 100 years old, um, we would still require that change to take place. Um, so that is something that has been uh, catching some folks off guard that is very important to note is that GFCI standard. And of course, exit signs are now 24 hours if they're damaged, missing or obstructed or not illuminated properly. And those were not previously 24 hours. And as you can see, there's a trend where a lot of things that were not emergency items are now emergency items. And fire extinguishers are now a 24 hour correction as well. And this is one that I run into all the time that get some folks frustrated, um, especially with initial inspections when we're trying to get people moved in and leases and vouchers approved. Sometimes I will find an expired service tag or the fire extinguisher on the property has not been serviced uh, in over a year. And in that case, we would require those extinguishers to be serviced and to have proof of that uh, in order to pass that inspection. So that would also be the case if the extinguisher was, let's say, overcharged or undercharged uh, or missing, that would be a 24-hour fail item. And now we also have uh, very much more clear deficiencies. Um, and this is a big improvement, I think, with Inspire, is it's very clear on the uh, HVAC deficiencies. And the one I'm going to focus on is heating systems. So we're coming up on October, so this is going to be very relevant. Um, whenever we have a a uh, heating system, primary heating system that is not working, or its in functionality is impacted in some way, or let's say the unit's uh, temperature is below 64 degrees Fahrenheit. When we're within the months of uh, October 1st and March 31st, that is going to be a 24-hour fail for those issues. And so now we have a different uh, temperature range. Let's say it's between October 1st and March 31st but the temperature is between 64 and 67.9 degrees Fahrenheit. When the inspector measures that temperature and we have it between those two temperatures, that would be a 30 day fail. So that's uh, the difference between and severity between uh, 24 and 30 day for heating systems. And uh, as we had outlined earlier, another major change are smoke detectors. So, um, this has also been another one that has come up frequently. Smoke detectors are, of course, 24 hours. That's not new. But also, we need them inside each bedroom and outside the bedroom and on each level. And the smoke detectors outside of the bedroom may also satisfy the requirement of being on each level, as, as long as it's in that uh, area right outside the bedroom or in the living space. So 
as we also noted, we want to make sure that we're installing those smoke detectors no more than 12 inches from the ceiling if they're installed on the wall. And if they're installed on the ceiling, we don't want them, uh, let's say, closer than four inches uh, to the wall. And that's just to make sure we get the most safety out of these smoke detectors. And now here's another one that's uh, been a pretty big deal. So we've got urban and open one bedrooms or just bedrooms in general. So whenever we have, um, let's say we go out for initial inspection and we were doing HQS, let's say we come across a bedroom or a quote unquote bedroom space, a unit that's being marketed as a one bedroom, but it doesn't have a window. When we were doing HQS, we would say that's that's just not a bedroom, we can't do it. Um, we would say that it's we have to have that as a zero bedroom with a zero be uh, bedroom voucher payment standard or VPS. Now that we're with Inspire, there's there's less clear definitions for what a bedroom is. So now what we've been doing at SHA is we've been saying, if the room is fully enclosed by walls, partially or fully enclosed by walls, it will not need any additional documentation to prove that it's a bedroom. So let's say most commonly we have a unit, we walk in, we see a room that's fully enclosed by walls, uh, but it doesn't have a window. And assuming it has the smoke detector, it has those electrical requirements, meaning uh, two outlets or one outlet and one fixture, we would say that's that's a bedroom, we can do it. And we would call that a one bedroom when we're giving our uh, voucher payment standard out. But if that criteria is not met, we're still gonna need some documentation from the city or local agency saying that the space is a bedroom. And if we don't have that, we can't, we just can't call it a bedroom. So to get into what that looks like, um, lofted spaces we would consider as a one bedroom, we could approve that. So basically we have a living room and then we have some stairs and then we have the uh, main sleeping area, for example. So a lofted unit that technically is not a separate room or space, as long as it's lofted, we could call that a bedroom and approve a bedroom payment standard for that space. And here's a more clear example, too, of a approved one bedroom, no documentation needed. As you can see, <clears throat> you've got the main living area, the kitchen, and then above that, you've got the sleeping area or the bedroom, and you've got a door going into that area. And you can clearly see that that space is fully enclosed by walls. And now the other thing that we, to the right, as you can see, that is just an open space. There's no fourth wall showing that as a separate space. So we would evaluate that when we do the inspection and we would say it's, we can't call that a bedroom because it's not fully enclosed by walls on all sides, part, partially or fully. And so we would need documentation from the city or another credible source, such as a blueprint or plan set um, from the SDCI website saying, look, this space is a bedroom. But this is uh, one of the biggest changes with Inspire. And to be frank, it's actually been really, it's been great because it used to be that we, when we walked into a unit and we were doing HQS for initial inspections, um, we would always be disappointed when we have to tell the participant and the landlord that we can't call it a bedroom, even though for all intents and purposes, it, the space could be a bedroom. So this has actually been very helpful for our folks. Um, and it's just given us a lot more flexibility uh, for our landlord partners as well. And as far as resources go, um, I encourage everybody to look at uh, the Inspire standards online. Um, again, this is publicly available information, and you can also get um, all PIH notices and updates to the Inspire standards. Um, you can even have a uh, email notification for that if you want to. But if you just Google Inspire standards, you can see every single standard pop up. And this is gonna be great because if you're ever wondering, oh, I just had my inspection, but I'm not sure if that's a fail item or what happens here, then you can actually go and look yourself um, because now we are all gonna be using these same standards and it's just gonna be much more clear for everybody. And um, if you're in Seattle, like me, um, I encourage you to contact my boss, um, Ann Conti. She's the one who did this presentation last year and that would be ann.conti at seattlehousing.org.